And sometimes I think we Africans have left so many aspects of ourselves unexplored because we simply take the framework of the West and, and then try and fit ourselves in there. There are so many aspects of ourselves that we have left unexplored that we must explore because they begin to make so much sense and then you begin to walk in your own path. Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women whose careers and open ethos have pushed the boundaries of what it means to build community and succeed as a collective. I am Betty Kankambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. Molinga Mpundu Kapwepwe is an award-winning author and playwright. Molinga's creativity was encouraged by her father, former vice president of Zambia, Simon Kapwepwe, who was an author himself. She began writing her own plays early on in her career with a lack of formal theater education. Molinga's passion is preserving the history and culture of her people. In 2016, she co-founded the Zambian Museum of Women's History, an initiative to spotlight Zambian women who have contributed to the country's traditional and contemporary history. She believes African proverbs are life hacks and so should be preserved and passed on to generations. Molinga sits on many boards and chairs many art and literary institutions in Zambia. She also owns a football academy for women, some of whom have gone on to play for the Zambian women's football team. Welcome on Inspiring Open, Molinga Kapupwe. Tell us about your childhood and how your parents brought you up. Okay, um, I was born uh, before this country gained independence, which we gained uh, independence in 1964. So I was born... um, some years before that, in 1958. And so I kind of remember a little bit of the colonial experience because my father was so involved in the um, in the struggle for the independence of this country. I think from, from the time I was small, what this country means, what a, what a country means, actually, um, on an individual level, I think was 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 very amplified because it was really the topic of discussion in in our family. You know, uh, for us it was um, about independence. You know, my father was imprisoned and you know all that stuff. So the whole struggle and what it means to be part of a nation or to even bring a nation into existence was very much part of of my worldview. And also the fact that um, my father and his friends were very deeply committed and uh, to serving and uh, to service uh, in terms of the country and its people. I think the whole idea of of service and serving others was also something else that that just came with the um, with my mother's milk, I guess. Um, so yeah, I come from a, a background uh, where the the whole reality of what you can do with your life and and not just for yourself but for others was uh, played out right in front of me. And so I think being in service and uh, serving others um, uh, is is just something that I think has come naturally just from watching my parents and how they went about it because both of them were very much involved, but also just in their daily lives. You know, I remember my mother, I remember we're going somewhere and my mother, and my, my mother saw this, this woman walking on the side of the road, she had just obvious, you know, it was near the maternity hospital. And I think this woman had just given birth or something. And she was like walking really slowly. And she was obviously, you know, not in, very comfortable. And I remember my mother stopped the car and <laughs> got out and said, where are you going? You know, did you just give birth? And this woman said, yes. And my mother said, we immediately aborted our <laughs> wherever we were going. And my mother said, no, we have to take you wherever you're going. Because this woman was going quite far. So our whole visit to whoever we were going to was abandoned and we took this woman home who, you know, of course we didn't, I knew my mother didn't know who this woman was or whatever it is, but it was, for me, it stuck in my head like, oh, you know, when, when, when there's need, you know, you, you, you should be able to see it and, and try and address it. And I think that's also been just part of, 
of of what life has been i think for me uh, in terms of how i i want to live my life so it's it's kind of like goes from from that point people know your father as um somebody who really fought for his nation um and later became the vice president and they know your father for his politics uh, side and also his love for his country beyond what people know you know your father as an artist and he nurtured the artistic qualities in you tell us about the artistic side of your father and how he gave you the liberty to also express yourself as an artist absolutely yeah my father was uh, my father was an artist i think for me <laughs> um for me above all you know he was a politician and whatever but for me he was uh, he was an artist my father was a was a writer he authored quite a number of books um and so i think because i was kind of like the the the, the artistic child in the family we we struck up a chord i think and uh, my father really encouraged me to be an artist you know he 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 always said if you want to be an artist be an artist so <laughs> there was just one conditionality though was go to school go to finish your secondary school go to university get a degree and then do whatever you want you know as as, as an artist but don't forget your art um I, i was a very i was very good at the visual arts i think if my father came back alive he'd be quite surprised that i'm actually not a visual artist <laughs> now I, I, i write like him i'm very appreciative of the fact that i actually had a father who supported what i am you know because i i am an artist i was born uh, that way um so you know both my parents actually supported me very very much whether it was later on when my father was gone and my mother was still there and i was researching for my books or my plays you know my mother would always you know if i asked what's this or what does this mean she'd always like be the one who would say okay this means this you know this looks like this and she would send me that thing So both of them actually supported me and um I'm very grateful for that because I see a lot of parents discouraging their kids who are born um artist or artistic and that I think can be a very painful place to be as a human being because you know these are gifts we come with and um if you're not encouraged to express them it can be a very painful or confusing place to be your father is such an important person in Zambia's history and obviously his legacy and who he was follows you everywhere but i wonder if there are some advantages and disadvantages to this absolutely <laughs> you know um having a name or living in the shadow of uh, someone who was that large on uh, on our national stage um is a double edged sword um sometimes no matter what you do it's like no it's that's because she's this or this is because her father was that you know but <laughs> even if it's your own effort and your own sweat uh some people tend to kind of write you off because no it's because of whatever and in other in other on the other side of the of, the, of that same coin sometimes it can be very gratifying because you can you know for me the most satisfying thing about <laughs> about my father's legacy i think is just uh, you know meeting people who who remember my father you know who say oh do you know i met your father on this and this and occasion and this is what happened or this is what my father your father did it saved my wife's life or you know just i i like um i like to share those kind of things about my father with people uh, because it just like brings him back for me um so that's that's for me that's that's a, a pleasurable part of that thing but otherwise my father always kind of stressed that you know what um this whatever it is you know my my being known and whoever i am whoever i made myself to be is is mine you know <laughs> i mean you go out and make make your own be who you are make your own a uh, stage and and play your parts on those stage this was my stage you know so um that's very much part of also the way i see the world uh, it, it, i am on a big stage which 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 is huge simply because of that name but i'm i'm writing my script i love that you're writing your script i really love that 
I don't think it will be fair to talk about your father and not talk about your mother because I mm. had I had you tell a story about how your mother was so part of who your father was and particularly the author side of your father. Your mother would mm. type your father's manuscripts and yeah. there's a story about how when your father was uh, about to be arrested, your mom did everything mm. to save a particular manuscript uh, that your father yeah. had written. Can you tell us about that story? I think it's so interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, and this happened shortly after we were born, actually, because my father was arrested. Like, uh, when I say we, it's because I'm a twin, <laughs> by the way. Um, there's two of us. So it's shortly after we were born, uh, we were born like in October. My father was arrested, I think, uh, by like January. But he had just finished writing uh, a manuscript, which which um, had been rejected by um, the colonial, you know, publishing house because they thought it was a little bit too political. Um, and so I think it, it was actually one of the things that they wanted actually to confiscate. So, but anyway, because my mother was such was always such a part of my father's writing process, you know, she was editor, critique, uh, <laughs> everything, uh, wrote into one, and, you know, the person who typed up everything. Um, she knew one the value of the content. She she'd worked on it as well. She'd put her sweat her sweat in there, and both of them valued that work and they and they didn't want to lose it. And so my mother, um, when when my father was arrested, uh, my mother made sure she actually hid that manuscript as they searched the house. And after you know they 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 missed it and they didn't actually find it, she um, through the help of some friends actually managed to smuggle it to Egypt where it stayed <laughs> until uh, 1967, uh, like three years after independence. Um, and then they, you know, those friends, uh, and I think actually mom went to Egypt and um, they, she came back with, with the manuscript. And uh, that was when, you know, the, the, my father again submitted it now to <laughs> a post-colonial publishing house. And they actually published it. And um, two years ago, I actually turned that uh, book into a play, into a musical, actually. And uh, we actually performed it um, in about three, three, four different towns um, here in Zambia. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was great for me because I, I, was, I felt like I was wor working with my parents <laughs> on the play because I knew how much they put into it, but. I was also kind of working with it and, 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 you know, when you read your own father's thoughts and, you know, your mother was in there as well, it was very, very, um, I don't know, it was a, a very delightful experience for me, I think, just to work with my father's words, work with his ideas, and then put my own ideas with his ideas to make it into a stage play. So that was, for me, that book uh, has become even more special. The first time you walked into an office, to experience mm. what a formal job was like. You could <laughs> not imagine sitting no. at one place from morning <laughs> till, till evening. You just, mm -hmm. that, that was not the kind of life that you, you know, you imagined you, you could do. Tell me mm. about that experience and, um, you know, what, what happened from there? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know how, Kind of, you're, you know, you're told you're on the right path when you're, you know, you've done your school, you've gone to university, you've graduated. Now the next thing is that you must get a job. You know, this is how life progresses. And um, and and I think already in my head, I wasn't really kind of <laughs> looking for that. But I got a job. So the first the first day I went into that office and, you know, this was like a really, really nice place to work, actually. Um Ah, the feeling that came over me was just like, what? <laughs> you know, I look at, I looked at, and this was a huge, it was a huge corporate. <laughs> and I was looking at everybody and thinking, what, these people come here every day <laughs> and sit in these little rooms from eight until five o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> and this is like, <laughs> this is like their life every, like every day, every week, every month, you're giving away eight hours of your life, literally. To come and sit in, in a room and whatever, push the papers or whatever it is that you're doing, like, what? How much are you missing? You know, <laughs> like, 
<laughs> how much how much are you missing that's going on out there you know what i mean for me it was just like mm, no i don't think so this I knew I needed to kind of like get the experience, you know, the formal experience of working and, you know, learning the ropes and this is how a job works and whatever. But I kind of just said to myself, I, you know, I don't think so. I, I will be here for the experience, but I need to find, I need to find a way <laughs> of earning an income and, and sustaining my, my, myself, but not in a box. <laughs> for eight hours <laughs> a day um yeah so i i kind of you know stuck that out for like eight years and then i when i thought okay so i've learned enough i set up my own uh, consultancy company and and started doing work which i thought to for me uh suited me more than <laughs> than just going and sitting in a box yeah, so I kept on working as well as an artist, um, as well as doing all those other things. You know, I, you know, consulted for UNESCO. I sat on the board of UNESCO. I sat on the board of museums. I chaired the Atiro Network, which was a, a, a continent-wide network of artists for four years. Um, yeah, so a lot of um, stuff that for me, I think, uh, all kind of stemmed from um, the way my life progressed from that first day. <laughs> in that box uh, called an office, <laughs> which inspired me to to just promise myself I'd live life on my terms. You've gone on to write plays, to write books, and you've won so many awards. When you started out, what was the literary scene like for Zambian women? You know, there were, there were a few women who kind of stood out, who, who inspired me. Uh, in the art scene, but there were some women, you know, like Cynthia Zucas, uh, um, Nora Mumba, uh, Frida Nkonde, you know, Frida, Frida was in theater, Nora was a writer, Cynthia was a visual artist. There were, there were some women who, who stood out and inspired, uh, Susan Chitabanta, she was an author. There were, there were women who had, you know, already kind of, uh, cleared the path. And who were making waves in the art world. And um, when I got into theater and so forth, it, it was some of that inspiration that, that you know, the Vivian Silwambas and people like that who were on the acting side. I can't, I can't act, <laughs> even if they paid me a million dollars, but I can write the, ri- the lines for you <laughs> to act. So, but I was inspired by the acting, by the writing, by the whatever. I'd never... And this is this is this is something that I should that I should say because the first play that I wrote, I had no idea how to write a play. I mean, like you know, I was just like, okay, so what's a scene? What's an act? What's a you know? I, I was <laughs> wow. I went and sat with like, people who knew how to do it, and I was like, okay, so what's an act? Okay, what's a scene? Okay, what's the difference between this and that? Okay, so I'm going to write. <laughs> and, I had, and I told myself, I, I told myself this. I said, you know what? I bet Shakespeare didn't go to any school to go and learn how to to write a, a play. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. so I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to do that as well. I don't think he knew how to do it. So I sat <laughs> down. I knew I had a good story. <laughs> I just didn't know how to make it into a play. So I sat down with, uh, with uh, a playwright and I said, okay, so what's the scene? And they explained to me, and what's the thing? And I, so I went back, I sat, I, write, I wrote uh, the play. <laughs> and then I went back, I said, does this make sense? And I was like, yeah, actually, that makes sense. And uh, that play literally won all the awards, the national awards on the night when we had the, it had, wow. it, it won, yeah, it won best script, it won best actor, it won best producer, it won best director. It won. <laughs> Why are you kidding me? <laughs> no. Incredible. So my, my, my lesson here to anybody is that, you know what, don't be daunted if you don't know how to do something. Just find out how to do it and go for it. Don't let I don't know how to do this be an excuse. Yes. No, just just do it. I mean, so what if it bombs? You know what I mean? <laughs> For me, it's not every play of mine that has been wonderful and successful and whatever it is. But I can tell you that every play, whether it's been a success or not, has taught me lessons, has, has been a valuable lesson uh, for me to go to the next one, to the next play, to do it better to see how I can get, you know, more of the audience's interest, whatever. But every lesson I've learned has come from 
not just from success, a lot of it has come from failure as well. So to tell you the truth, I have um, a big problem <laughs> in seeing the difference between failure and success, because for me, both of them have the same weight in yeah. my life. They're both very, very good for me in terms of lessons. Yeah. Your kind of art is deeply rooted in culture and history. Mm. What sparked your interest in that direction? What what really inspired you to take mm. it all the way to the point of even creating the museum for Zambian women? The, the basic policy in our household was for my parents was that they, they would really they, they they wanted us deeply rooted in our culture and our, our and our history um, but also to grow as far as possible you know to deep deep roots but very long branches you know and those branches should touch whatever whatever aspect of life you wanted not just not just your own and um you know, it's funny, I was saying that uh, my father kept literally everything that I ever wrote, whether it was a poem or a composition or whatever it is. And um, when I went home, I found my composition that I'd written when I was, I think I was 11 years old. And I was talking about the importance of culture and history. And <laughs> nothing has changed. <laughs> that 11-year-old was saying exactly what I would say today. You know, wow. I was I was good. Yeah, I was so shocked. I was like, you mean I was already thinking like this when I was 11? Because I had I had even forgotten. <laughs> but I was quite amazed. Like, okay. So I was already thinking like this when I was 11. It was um, a calling <laughs> right from the beginning. Yeah, I think so. And I think uh, also like conversations with my dad, I guess. Um, but also just the general, you know, atmosphere. Uh, I, I, so... It, it comes from that. And um, I I think that now I understand has been has been literally the path that I have followed because <laughs> the, the, the thought process in that composition of that 11-year-old is literally the same thought process now. The, the importance of preserving our own culture, the, the importance of preserving our history. And for me, the two marry very well um, because... There is so much value in our history and there's so much value in our culture. And when the two, for me, when the two come together, it's such a powerful spark. Um, a lot of my plays are actually uh, historical. So they need a lot of research. Sometimes I research for three years before I actually put a play on because I want all the facts to be right, you know, historically and everything else. But um, for me, that point of contact between history and culture has has been very very important in the way that I've actually um, articulated my my art, um, and whether I'm writing a play or a book, I think those two always come together for me. One because I'm really worried about um, losing our culture because that's our library. You know, our languages store so much. Science stores history. Is, stores everything our languages are also our libraries um so everything that makes our culture and and our history is really what makes our lives have context and meaning and therefore value so i tend to bring those two together in literally everything i do and culture is those culture and history are also happening now and and being made now and uh, so even some of my plays were very much current, especially when I was doing the HIV side. One of the things, one of the plays that I did, which was called um, Choosing Between Eating and Breathing, was simply because of what I, I had to work with commercial sex workers. And for me, it became very interesting the way, the reasons why they were doing commercial sex work in such a dangerous time, but also what kind of human beings, you know, just ordinary human beings they were. And the place kind of like based on those on those kind of things, and it was very interesting for me to <laughs> to see the reaction from the audience <laughs> uh, around that one. But you know, the thing that I think for me also the the, the female, the feminine, has also been very important um, to me. And because I think because of the role my mother also played, uh, and she was a very 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 um, courageous woman, and and she played uh, her role 
in a lot of courageous situations during the struggle. But having seen all that, all I ever heard really was about my father, you know, whereas my mother had also done a tremendous amount of work to get to where we were in terms of independence. So when the whole, you know, for me, it bothered me that uh, women, women's history was not being told. You know, there are so many women who have done so much in this country in terms of the liberation struggle, in terms of um, breakthroughs in their own professions. And that just wasn't being told. So my friend and I sat over coffee one day and decided, OK, you know, and this is a legacy from my parents, as you as I as I pointed out, <laughs> if there's a need, then you should stop and address it. You know, like the way my mother you know, gave a lift to that woman who had just had a baby. If you see something, then you should you should you should be able to do something. If not you, then who will do it? So I always sat down and said, you know what? There's no women's history going on around here. So <laughs> why not establish a women's history museum? And fortunately, we live in a digital age. So we said, well, if we we if we're going to wait and raise money to build a, a structure, it's going to take too long. So let's let's create a virtual uh, museum and and take it from there. And it's been a wonderful experience, I must say, um, in the sense of the reception, the, the reception that the museum has received, the um, the kind of ideas we're pushing, you know, through the the, the, the museum, the visibility we've given to women. Um, you know, we we partnered with uh, with with Wikipedia as well in terms of training about 34 young people to write the histories of, of, of Zambian women. And I think if you go to, to, to Wikipedia now, I think Zambia probably has more women in Wikipedia than any other country in Africa because we've been pushing, we've been pushing our writers and we got them trained by Wikipedia and they've been writing and posting as much as possible because we, we are determined from the angle of the, of the museum that women should also uh, occupy their place in history. And so that has been uh, gratifying in so many ways. Uh, we're currently, we're currently um, engaged in the whole um, uh, repatriation of objects uh, back to Africa and so forth. But, you know, our conversation is very different, I think, from everybody else because we're a virtual museum. But, you know, that all, all that ties up, you know, in terms of your question, all that ties up for me in terms of, I think, how I grew up, what culture, history, and also the role of women in, in both culture and history, what that has been, and how does that then translate into, into, into modern life and, 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 and mainstreaming it as knowledge uh, for people to actually be able to say, oh, oh, I know that woman, she did this and this and this in our history, or... I didn't know there was this woman and she did that. Oh, she's responsible for, you know, the vaccination or the way we now handle, you know, uh, cattle vaccinations or whatever. You know, there, there were so many things that came out that people didn't know that it's women in our country who actually did them first or led the way to that. So everything has kind of tied up, I think, for me, simply because I think that 11-year-old and this 63-year-old <laughs> are still talking the same language. As you were speaking, I was thinking and imagining how women have been written out of history. Even yeah. in Ghana here, for a very long time, the only woman whose name was mentioned in our history was Yasan Toa, and I think she fought during the colonial uh, rule. And that's about yeah. the only name we know. All the rest are men. So were there no women existing at that time? Were yeah, there exactly. no women living at that time? They didn't do exactly. anything. When I came to Ghana, I went to visit the the museum, the Ashanti Museum, and uh, it you know it, it 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 struck me just how similar the whole Ashanti monarchy and and uh, even just the the, the structures of uh, matrilineality and all that is very very similar to mine. Very very very, and the power of women in matri matriarchal and matrilineal societies is sometimes um, hidden, but it is the most powerful, you know? Yeah. And yeah, and those are the kind of things, because we 
tend to analyze everything from kind of like this Western perspective where the West only sees power in, in the most visible forms or whatever. We have so many ways of hiding power um, and in so many places. And these are the kind of things that we also want to bring out and say, you know what, the powerful person behind this, this man, <laughs> all the decisions that were actually being made were actually by the women behind him. He was merely the 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 the, the, the if you want the ventriloquist dummy, but he was merely voicing what the women were actually saying. Um, our concept of power, and I think we sometimes I think we Africans have left so many aspects of ourselves unexplored because we simply take the framework of the West and and then try and fit ourselves in there. There are so many aspects of ourselves that we have left unexplored that we must explore because they begin to make so much sense. And then you begin to walk in your own, in your own path. When you have to, when you, when you try and walk in somebody else's path, which they know, and they've walked and you know, whatever, you know, you, you keep stumbling and falling, and whatever. When you do it from a place where you know, and where you're going and where you've come from, um, I think it becomes a, a much richer experience. So, you know, by all means, look at other paths, but define your own. And we have tended to 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 um, take the lens. You know, we of course we're all going to the West to get trained in gender and whatever, <laughs> and all those perspectives come from there. But we had our own perspectives, and we we knew how to articulate those powers and how we shared them and where we put them and where we hid them and where we put them out in the open. But we sort of don't have discussions around those kind of things. And um, so it's something that we're trying to do at the museum as well, put some of that stuff into the mainstream. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. We really need to find our own path. It brings me to proverbs and your mm -hmm. love for proverbs. And you have a <laughs> book on proverbs. And yeah. for a very long time, I thought of proverbs as I mean, in the present age, if I situate it in, in this present age, all I see is that, oh, it makes language rich. So when somebody is speaking and the person uses a lot of proverbs, I say, oh, his language is very rich. <laughs> or when yeah. the person writes, I'm like, oh, that's such a rich language. And then <laughs> you put it in a whole new perspective that proverbs are life hacks. Tell me about how you came to that realization that Proverbs are life hacks. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, you know, and that's this is where it goes back to the to my passion. I think for culture and all that stuff. And part of the biggest part of our, our cultures is our language. And when you dive into your language, and I encourage everybody to dive into theirs, <laughs> um, you discover such such gems. Um, Especially when, you know, when you come from, from cultures that, that didn't write, the language becomes where everything is written. Everything. Uh, and the language carries that weight, huh? that, that, that heavy load of literally communicating everything, the knowledge of that, of that, of that people. And, um, you know, Proverbs are fascinating me because the the proverbs one they sound nice, you know. As you said, you know they make your speech, you know, rich and wonderful, and you know you look smart <laughs> because you can. But they 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 um, they are also very small and very dynamic packages of very multi dimensional information. You know, I can I can tell you something and it will sit with you. I can I can say a proverb to you and it will sit with you in so many places because you're like, ah yeah, you know. <laughs> it was so that I always tell people that you know what in Africa we didn't need um psychoanalysts coach uh, you know, where you go and lie on the couch and somebody's and it's like we just needed proverbs, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they sorted you out, you yeah. know, because they they yeah, they they gave you and this is why it was important for the from the time you're small you start learning proverbs until 
it was it literally the duty of every individual to pass on the proverbs to the next person because proverbs told you how to look at situations. You know, they they told you uh, how to manage your life. You know, don't procrastinate. Or if you procrastinate, this is what happens. Um, share with whoever. You know, it's only the... There are so many ways. It's every way of looking at life. And every situation might have 10 proverbs. But because life is like that, because life doesn't have one solution or one way of look, of being looked at. And proverbs kind of provide that whole multidimensional way of looking at something. And so it, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a way that actually psychologically, you're not stuck if you, know, if you know proverbs. You will find something that will actually point you to the, to the right direction of looking at something like, oh, okay, okay, so tomorrow will be another day. I do not need to despair that today has gone so badly. You know, it's a, it's a life hack. It's, it's, it's another way of moving on to the next day with a fresh mind, Watcha, watcha na mano, which means, you know, every dawn comes with its own opportunities, its own, um, a mano is like intelligence. You'll think differently. You'll see life differently when the dawn comes. So, you know, don't despair. There's so much support in terms of, um, psychological balance, social balance. You know, the, the, the human, the human essence, if you want, is very supported by being able to contextualize life. And Proverbs do that very, very well. And that is why some cultures some cultures have lost the power of their Proverbs, which I think is uh, very sad <laughs> because you lose a huge amount of context um, for, for, for people. You, 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 you lose a huge amount of... Um, of the ability for people to resolve problems within themselves and between themselves. So we should keep them alive and we should keep uh, translating them and keeping, I, I like it when I see a proverb printed on the back of a bus <laughs> or on a t-shirt or anything like that, because I'm thinking, okay, that one's still alive. Um, but we also constantly make new proverbs and we're not even capturing those because we kind of are not thinking about it. But they are, they are literally, words have the power to carry uh, the therapy that we need or the solution that we need for a situation. So I, I, I particularly like Proverbs. One, also, they just summarize situations <laughs> very quickly. You know, there, there are times when I'm watching something happening in some far-off country, and, I, and I'm thinking, oh, if just tell that person that proverb. You know what I mean? <laughs> In my mind, I'm thinking, if you just tell this person that proverb, this situation will be sorted because that proverb would have. Would have <laughs> I had so many. Yeah, I'm just like, tell him this proverb. That situation will be so clear in an instant because we're like, oh, okay. This is a, because also proverbs are very multidimensional in the way they they examine things. You know, we tend, to, especially in this day and age, we we tend to be very, um, try to be very logical and very. Um, linear in the way we look at something, but Proverbs make things more multidimensional so you can look at the same thing from a lot of different directions in that three seconds that you're given a proverb. And so that linear, the linearity of looking at something from just like one side can also just be resolved by by a proverb. Uh, and so for me, you know, for me, these are the kind of things that, that Africans African universities <laughs> should have whole curriculum, you know, <laughs> a whole curriculum studying that because it is a powerful, powerful tool in society. It, these are very powerful um, <laughs> um, pillars in any society that actually help the society move in a different direction or yeah. in the direction that they need to be. Yeah, but we, we will throw them away. We will forget them, and that for me, we would have thrown away a major psychological tool um, that actually helped and has helped us for centuries. That is why you have proverbs in every every culture, because the human mind needs that kind of multi-dimensionality to look at life. And talking about culture, there's this domination of culture from the West, and many Africans are ditching their own culture to embrace wholeheartedly the one from the West. And 
I don't see why we can't have both. This is a big one. One, there is no cultural vacuum. So when you lose your culture, it means another culture is coming in because there's no such thing as a cultural vacuum. So culture is, and I'm kind of saying the word, although there are so many aspects of culture, but I'll say it as a word just to make the picture more vivid. Cultures thrive and cultures can die. Um, And even when they are dead, cultures can be resurrected. Cultures can refuse to grow and cultures can grow. Cultures can refuse to cross the border or boundary or neighborhood or even from uh, one domestic culture to another. You know, you, you can marry into another family and take your culture and your culture will not <laughs> take root there. Or maybe your culture will actually dominate that, that other culture that you find there. Some cultures are very dominant and very aggressive. Some are very conscious of that aggression. And they're very conscious of wanting to be the dominant culture, which is <laughs> very much the West, um, because they have decided their culture is the right culture. So all of us must kind of <laughs> um, fall in line. Cultures are like that. They can be very aggressive. They can kill another culture. They can swamp another culture. They can dominate, take over, oppress. They can suppress. And so you, the best way to survive in terms of your own culture is to be very conscious of what is happening to your culture. Is there another culture that you're that is coming into your culture? What is it doing to your culture? What can you do about it? Because like I said, some cultures can die, but they can be resuscitated. Some aspects of culture can die and they will die forever. Sometimes the, those aspects are killed by their own, the owners of that same culture. But you can revive cultures, you can make them live on forever, or you can make them live for a very short time. It is entirely up to the owners of the culture. And we are owners of cultures, but we're very unconscious owners of those cultures. And we're not seeing the cost, we're not examining what's coming at us, we're not, we're being swept by a flood of whatever the cultural glitter is coming from somewhere without examining, is this really glitter or is this just uh, surface stuff that is not going to... When you get another culture and you adopt it into your culture, you are also adopting the problems of whatever you're adopting from that other culture. Do you have the, the, the wherewithal to pay the price that that other culture has paid? So there's there's so many aspects. And my call to Africa is let's become conscious of what is happening to our cultures. Let's make those conversations take place. The healthiest cultures are those that are conscious of what is happening to them. The most painful thing in human, the psychology of a human being and the psychology of a society is the loss of culture. And that pain shows in many ways. Um, In some cultures we've seen, it has shown in in literally mass alcoholism, where where the pain of the loss of culture translates in a lot of social ills, alcoholism, psychosis, you know, but it's the pain of losing the culture. It it is painful because culture is like the medium, it's like uh, a fish and water. Culture is the medium through which we exist on the planet. And once you lose the medium through which you exist, if you put a fish out of the water, it's a painful experience. So for Africa, we really, for me, those are the things that we should be discussing in African universities. <laughs> Not, uh, you know, whether Freud is the father of psychoanalysis exclusively. But what what is it? What is culture? What are our cultures? What are the things that are still in existence in our culture? What about this? What about that? How do we make this come alive? How do we make this die? Whatever. But we must decide ourselves. And when we're conscious, we are more able to do that. And we're more able to say, well, that which is coming, we don't think is going to do us much good because we've seen the problems that it's leaving behind in its wake in that other culture. 
or it's good, but in this culture, it will look different because we will handle it like this. We don't have a platform. We don't have an avenue. We don't have a conversation that is actually discussing all those things. And if we don't, we will suffer all the things that I've talked about, that we will meet cultures that are so dominant and aggressive that they will swamp us. They will dominate us. They will make us forget who we are. And we will not even realize until it's too late. Yeah. Can you imagine not rooted in anything and a strong wind comes? You know, it blows exactly. you anywhere it wants to take you. So there's, there's a proverb for that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that proverb. <laughs> In, yeah, in my language, we have a saying that says, which means wherever the wind blows, that is the direction we all go because it is, you're not rooted in anything. Yes. You're just pushed around by whatever force comes. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, that, that's such a sad place to be. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So, Molenga, um, it brings me to open. My simple question is what does being open mean to you being open is is it is being able to not you know one of the things about culture also is that it's very judgmental culture is very judgmental <laughs> we tend to judge others from our position you know what i mean this i'm better because that other these other people they eat that food me i eat this food so i'm the better one whatever yeah yeah so not to be being open for me is not to be judgmental before i even know anything but also just not to be judgmental um I can make an opinion, I can form an opinion about something, but not based on judgment that I don't even have information about. <laughs> That's being open. It's being open to other opinions, other views, other perspective. You know, I, I, I always say when I, something, when I have been doing something or something, I need to think about something, I always say there must be another way because I think I have to leave myself open to to other ways of doing things, not just the way I do them. Because for me, every every person brings every person who I meet brings something of value. And for and as I said to you, for me, whether you are bad or mean or malicious to me or whatever, that's fine. You're bringing me a lesson. You know, it's 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 all good. <laughs> it's fine. So you, for me, being open means really being able to look at something from many different perspectives, not judging something when it um, is in front of me without, you know, without any cause to be. For me, a lot of my openness is about seeing opportunities, not for just myself, but for other people as well, to being open so that I receive the opportunities or I receive the information, I receive what I need for a particular time because if I'm not open um how will I how will I get what I what I need you know it's, it's like it's like not opening your mouth when there's food around you yeah you know yeah you you will starve but um so for me being open is is, is not just about uh, judgment or opinion or whatever it's also about opportunity it's about perspectives it's about ways of doing things it's about um receiving as well from others and one last thing because i know you're in ghana (laughs) (laughs) and this is for you because my father during the struggle for independence my father worked very closely with kwame nkrumah yes and um one trip when he came back from ghana uh, before independence one trip when he came back from ghana kwame nkrumah had given him this beautiful kente um and my father divided it into two and gave one half to 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 kenneth kaunda who would become the president and one half he kept. And um, when my father died, we actually buried him in that kente. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, it is. This is so amazing, Mulinga. And I'm so happy we could have this conversation. I-, I think it's really needed. And I'm so thankful you could make time for this. I am so grateful that you gave me the time to do this. Mulinga Mpundu Kapuipui, an award-winning author and playwright. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wikilove's Women 
This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Wikilove's Women on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open.